Hi, I'm Andrew, and first of all, I'd like to apologise that I'm not there presenting this live at the moment. I'm currently um, living with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19, so living in a tent in the back garden for the next 10 days, um, presenting this from a tent. Um, but I should hopefully still be there live to answer any and all questions you have at the end of the presentation. Um, but I'd like to start with this guy. This is, of course, the famous Greek uh, philosopher Aristotle. And he once said that the motions of pleasure and pain and generally all sensation plainly have their source in the heart and that the brain merely acts as a means to cool the heat produced by the heart. This is, of course, not correct. And we know that uh, the, the sensation and the seat of intelligence that he's referring to happens within the metabolically expensive brain, which in humans requires uh, between 20 and 25 percent of the daily resting energy, while only weighing 2 percent of the total mass. In other primates, this is between 8 and 10% of the daily resting energy, and in other mammals, between 3 and 5%. This is primarily down to just the sheer amount of neurons within the brain. And I could talk about neurons for a whole hour, but I've only got 10 minutes. So if you're interested, I'd highly recommend this book, The Human Advantage. It's a great book, very detailed, um, I'd highly recommend it. But what we need to take away from this book to proceed with the presentation is that each neuron, regardless of size, has the same energy budget and that the cerebral cortex, where higher cognition is thought to originate from, um, in humans has 16 billion neurons. Um, this is the highest amount of any animal ever recorded, even compared with animals uh, with a cerebral cortex twice our mass, such as the African elephant. Here, humans have over 10 billion more cortical neurons, despite the elephant's larger brain size. So in order to supply and maintain these neurons, uh, a high blood supply is needed. This is done through two pairs of arteries, the vertebral and the internal carotid. This study uh, focuses on the vertebral arteries. However, further work into the internal carotid arteries is going to be undertaken. So the vertebral arteries travel up uh, through your vertebral column, uh, through the transverse foramen in your cervical vertebrae. Um, they travel all the way up to C1, where afterwards they join at the base of the pons to form the basilar artery, which with the internal carotid arteries and several connecting arteries forms the cerebral arterial circle of Willis. This is a posterior anterior connection, which allows for a larger cerebral input and circulation throughout the brain. Interestingly though, Baldwin and Bell in 1963 and Ashwini et al in 2008 showed that the brain blood supply in some mammals was mainly from the internal carotid arteries and that the vertebral arteries only contributed small amounts or um, supplied the posterior section over the rest of the brain. Furthermore, they also showed that there was a lower mixing of blood between cerebral hemispheres. Looking at the images from Ashwini et al in figure one here, you can see the circle of Willis in a human, cow, sheep, goat and pig from left to right. And by just looking at the basilar artery or the BA in humans, you can see it's noticeably thicker than it is in the other animals. And there's also a more well-developed connection. It is these images and these, and these studies which have really propelled my study in this presentation into existence. So this study, looks at whether there is a relationship between vertebral blood flow to the brain and animal cognition. And if so, uh, does this relationship vary between or within taxonomic orders? So to do this, we got cervical vertebrae from mammals and birds, our two chosen groups. So here's a chimpanzee C3 and a bald eagle C3, so you can see what we're looking at. And we took measures of the transverse foramina. This is because the vertebral arteries which travel through them are the major occupiers and the main driving force between the shape. Therefore, taking the area of each transverse foramen um, gives you an accurate indicator of arterial blood flow to the brain. Uh, we also took measurements of the vertebral canal and vertebral body because this allows you to size adjust your transverse foramen measurement um, so you can have comparable results across the data set. Therefore, we can get our smallest mammal, the European mole, and our largest mammal, the African elephant, and have directly comparable results. Before we go further with the methods, though, I'd just like to take you on a quick trip down memory lane. Um, 20 years ago, in fact, to the 8th of July 2001. Google had just removed their exclamation mark and was coming up to their third birthday. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone had just been released in cinemas. And phones looked like this. Fast forward 10 years to the 8th of July 2011. Google has changed its logo slightly. Facebook, Twitter and YouTube are all in existence. 
and the iPhone 4S is dominating the phone market. So why did I show you that quickly? Why time travel? Well, a study of my nature, of this nature, would usually be taken uh, using high precision equipment in museums to work out the area of the transverse foramina. However, the internet is consistently growing and there's a whole wealth of resources that weren't available 10 or 20 years ago, such as the Virtual Museum of Idaho on the left, or websites such as Sketchfab and eSkeletons, and they all provide uh, accurate and detailed 3D models or photographs um, that can be used for research. And that's what I did. I did a bit of a combination. I took pictures of specimens that we had present in Bramble Museum at Bangor University, as well as using the images uh, from the websites I've just mentioned and some others in order to cre create uh, a full data set of cervical vertebrae present. This was also especially useful because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it meant that I could do all my work from a desk um, rather than have to travel to museums, as fun as that would have been. So uh, we've taken geometric morphometrics on the right and the left transverse foramina, averaged them and adjusted them for the vertebral canal area so we can have comparable results. I've touched on where we've got them from. Uh, and then we came to the exclusion criteria. So for reasons of their own physiology, owls, cetaceans and marine mammals were all removed uh, prior to analysis. And then finally, in order to um, compare the geometric morphometrics of something, uh, I did an animal cognition review. This involved um, reviewing every animal in the data set against 12 cognition factors that we found and ranking them in a binary system for presence or absence. Um, it was then uh, their marks were then totaled up at the end to give them a total assigned rank, um, depending on how many cognition factors they displayed. So here's the 12 factors. Feel free to not read them. There's quite a few of them, um, but they broadly encompassed aspects of theory of mind, social and emotional intelligence, um, tool manipulation and mental time travel. Um, it was by no means an extensive list and could con constantly be added to uh, if there were no time pressures involved. So what sort of results did we get? Well, looking at the 40 mammals across eight taxonomic orders in our linear regression, we got a positive significant relationship. So as transverse foramina area increases, so does higher order brain function. Uh, and therefore, the, there's a higher vertebral blood supply in species who display, uh, who display higher levels of cognition. Looking uh, in our avian species, we had 26 species across 10 taxonomic orders and also had a positive significant relationship. However, as you can see from the top right, the Corvus corax or the northern raven looks to be a bit of an outlier. Now, I did check it. It is a true value, um, but the lack of species between the total assigned rank of 2 and 11 means that um, it's a, the northern raven is a very influential point. So I removed them. And then we got a non-significant relationship, um, therefore showing that the inclusion of the raven or our current data set gives a misrepresentative picture of transverse foramina area and blood flow in aves. Um, the removal of the raven uh, was congruent with other evidence in the literature, which shows, uh, which shows that there was no increasing brain blood supply with behavioural complexity in aves. Uh, I also looked very quickly uh, within order, uh, as well as between them, um, in primates, artiodactyls, and carnivores. And there was no significant relationship for any uh, order. Um, even the removal of domesticated carnivores, such as domesticated dogs and cats, um, resulted in non-significant relationships, um, showing that the relationship between transverse foramina area and intelligence is reserved um, for between orders rather than within. Finally, some further analysis. I looked at comparing four variables that are used commonly within the literature to define intelligence and compared them with our two variables that we created for the study. So these four variables from the literature were the encephalization quotient, cortical neuron count, absolute brain mass and relative brain mass. And we got a graph a bit like this. Um, but if I direct your attention to cortical neuron count and total rank, we see the most significant relationship present. Uh, the encephalization quotient and absolute brain mass were also significant, but not quite so, uh, not quite as much as cortical neuron count was. Um, what this shows is that our total ranking system is accurate. Um, cortical neuron count is currently the biggest, uh, sorry, the single biggest biological indicator of intelligence um, within the literature.
Um, so shows that what we were doing is is accurate, which is which is always nice. Um, further, Ikaiki information criterion models or AIC models further confirm this by showing that the top three models with the most influence all included cortical neuron count. The same four factors were compared against our uh, transverse foramina average area, uh, and it showed cortical neuron count and absolute brain mass were significant. Uh, the encephalization quotient and relative brain mass weren't, um, but interestingly, this could be because they both use body mass to define um, intelligence, which uh, is suggested to be outdated now. So humans, do we really have a brain that's too big for our body? Again, I'll point you back in the direction of the Human Advantage book, because it goes over that in a lot more detail than I can cover in these last few seconds. Um, further, AIC models showed that total rank and absolute brain mass held the largest influence over the data set. And so to sum up this whole second part of the further analysis, we can say that the transverse foram foramina size is influenced by cognition, but also by general brain size. Um, the R squared values from our big graphs we had earlier on also confirm this as they were quite small. So our final conclusions are that as the presence of higher order brain function increases or the behavior is indicative of it, um, so does the vertebral artery blood supply to the brain. Vertebral artery size, however, isn't uh, or does not act as a single independent biological indicator of intelligence, like cortical neuron count is supposed to. Um, an investigation into the internal carotid arteries um, would give a bit more insight into total cerebral input and circulation, and even give a, um, some values on the ratio of blood perfusion within the brain, um, which would be really interesting to cover and what I'm hoping to do next. Um, so I'd like to say a huge thank you to, Bangi, to everyone at Bangor University for supporting me. And of course, these wonderful sites um, who provided all the, the resources I needed. I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Um, and finally, to the Anatomical Society for letting me present this today. Um, and thank you, Via. Thank you very much. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact me or ask my live counterpart who should be there right now. Uh, and I'm sure I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you very much for listening.